Hello and welcome back to Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. This is a space for conversations with global leaders, outstanding scientists, emerging innovators, and science entrepreneurs. We're discussing uh, people's research, their research journeys, and well, their general life experiences. Uh, I am uh, the interviewer for this session. Uh, my name is Adam Levy. I'm a science journalist and science communicator, but I'm not the only one who is able to ask questions. If you're watching this live, then you are able to also uh, offer up your questions. In order to do so, um, just raise your hand uh, virtually in Zoom. Uh, you'll then be, um, I forget the word, but highlighted in some way on Zoom. Um, and then when we have a chance, we'll come to your question and you'll be unmuted. If you have a follow-up question, that's great, um, but you will be muted again. So just raise your hand again and we'll go through the whole process again. If you have any technical difficulties, just drop them in the chat. There's no need to, um, to go through all that process and speak to us for those. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping uh, and uh, this conversation will be recorded and shared on the Falling Walls website after the summit. I am joined now by uh, Donna Strickland, professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Waterloo. Um, Donna's groundbreaking work on uh, pulsed lasers earned her the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018. 2018. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we need to start quite basic because lasers are an unusual thing in that everyone's heard of them, everyone's seen them, but I feel like people don't really appreciate what, what a laser is and what makes it special. So what is a laser? Yes, because it's not a Star Wars lightsaber, which just drives me nuts because that's just a light bulb. What makes a laser special is that all of the light goes together in one point, which means it's much more concentrated. It's more than that because in this regular light that you want, because it's white light, all the colors are there. So we light up and we see all the colors we're wearing. Um, and it's also going in all directions, which is great if you want to light somebody up. But if you really want your light to be intense, you want it all to be one color, all the crusts are together, not crust meeting troughs, which would cancel. And so that's how you get your most intense light. So uh, a laser has all of their light talking to each other. All of the light goes in the same direction, and that's how we make it very intense. And so actually it could be a very good weapon if we wanted to use it for that. So uh, that's what a laser is more generally. Uh, your work focuses on, uh, excuse my pun, but focuses on, on pulsed lasers. Um, a, a pulsed laser is a laser which effectively kind of flashes on and off. Is that correct? Well, it could be. I mean, we have different types of pulsed lasers, and so mine did. You would see the flash lamps go off, and they would last a millisecond, which, again, in my talk, I say that's, you know, 300 kilometers in space. That's how long, because light travels so fast. And uh, the pulses that I had from my original laser were just a third of a millimeter long. Uh, the ones that we would use now are... Um, 30 microns. And so really, if you could see the light pulses going along, they would look like those um, three-hole punch cutting out of paper, and it would just be that slice of little bit of paper running around that you would see it. So yeah, you wouldn't actually see it. It would be so fast. Now, now, given that we just spoke about lasers and their kind of continuous beam of light, mm -hmm. um, why would you want a laser which is not kind of this continuous focus, but yeah, these little blips going by? So sometimes, I like to say I built a laser hammer, and sometimes energy matters. And sometimes if you're just trying to heat something up, you just want the uh, energy on you all the time, and eventually you keep absorbing it and get hot. Um, and this is how laser machining works. Uh, but sometimes what you want is a laser hammer. And so the same analogous thing to just trying to drive a nail into a piece of wood. You can push that nail all you want. It's not going to go in, but you pick up a hammer and you hit it quickly, and in that nail goes. So there are some that just matters What's the total energy? And some applications really require energy per unit time. And so if you have that application, then you need a short pulse laser uh, because energy costs a lot of money. Um, it's b the more energetic the laser is, the bigger and more expensive it is. So if you just need energy per unit time, just make your time really short, energy not so much, and uh, it's much easier to get. Simple when you put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I'm gonna steal your metaphor, but um, yeah, why, why do you want a laser hammer? What are these applications where you need a hammer rather than a, a continuous push? So the ones that get used a lot now is, is to um, machine a glass 
parts. And so the one line I forgot to uh, give in my talk today was the fact that if I put a laser through the glasses I'm wearing, it would just go right through. The light would go right through because it doesn't absorb. Uh, the, the levels would be up in the ultraviolet and the laser would be lower power and just go through. And so we can't use that idea of absorption. Typically laser machining, when people hear about that, it will be on steel and it will be something that gets absorbed. But so we can't use absorption. Uh, and that's usually a one photon process, one photon interacting with an atom and making it move more. But what happens when you have it so intense, it's sort of like we just slap the electrons right off the atoms. The light just comes in and goes whack, and the electrons go. It only happens if you're intense. And so the advantage we have, not only can we cut glass objects, we can cut inside glass objects. And so I just had a young colleague show me his microfluidics channel that he had laser machined into a piece of glass. And again, if you use a lens to focus it down, at the surface, the intensity is not high. The uh, photons are wide across. Uh, but right when it comes to a focus point, then it's intense enough to cause damage. And so you can drill holes in glass, drill holes in the cornea of your eye. Uh, people are now uh, destroying the lenses. If you have to have uh, cataract surgery and your, your old lens is removed because they want to do surgery as minimally as possible, they used to be able to put in the fake lens through a very small hole. They wanted to bring out the old hard lens through the same small hole. You can now use my laser just to pulverize it <laughs> and then uh, pull it up a very small hole. On a personal level, to what extent are you motivated by the kind of pure physics, the joy of understanding and uh, learning to create these devices versus yeah, the kind of applications we've been speaking about just now. I've never been driven by the applications. Um, I really just like to have fun in the lab and I just uh, really like to see new things happen. And um, this is why I think I like lasers so much. It's that, especially short pulse lasers, nonlinear optics, we go in with one color and we make many different colors. So one of the experiments going on in my lab now is called multi-frequency Raman generation. And you go in with one pulse and it's separated by the same frequency, but you just see a whole pile of reds and oranges and yellows and greens. And you know, I can't show it when I show a PowerPoint slide. Our three color photography isn't nearly as good as our eye. Every little change in color, our eye sees it. So it's this beautiful, beautiful array of colors that we get to see in our lab. Uh, when I show it on a picture, it looks like three blues and three, orange, three yellows and three oranges, and it's just not right. So um, I, I should mention that the, the Nobel Prize was awarded for work that you actually undertook during your doctorate, is that yes. right? Um, and it's really lovely to see that you're still in, in love with lasers now. I do, yes. Um, how much have things advanced since that point where um, you, were, uh, you were doing your thesis um, to today? Oh, well, of course, things keep marching on. Pulses can't get too much shorter, though. It's, um, and when people say, how are we going to keep advancing it? Uh, you can only focus in the two dimensions down to the wavelength. You can only make your pulses short as that wavelength. You can't get shorter than that, or it wouldn't really be light anymore. It needs to at least have one wave. Um, so we will have to push to the XUV, which people are trying to do. But we have to do it in ways that are more efficient than we are right now. Um, but we've gotten down to out of second scale pulses using these high order nonlinear, and it's not even nonlinear, it's high intensity laser physics. Um, whereas, you know, we were at in grad school probably 100 femtoseconds, so 30th of a millimeter is how short the uh, pulse would be. And now, you know, we're almost three orders of magnitude shorter than that. Uh, we were at intensity levels of 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15. I think I could get up into the 10 to the 17. We're at 10 to the 23, so we've gotten a million times more intense but we still need one more order of million <laughs> to get to where we break vacuum. I love the, how casually you just meant a million times more intense. <laughs> it's been a million times more intense, yeah. and then we're going to make matter out of vacuum, so it'll be cool. I, I mean, could you expand on that? Um, yeah, can you expand on how we can... Make matter? So this is the idea is that uh, what Einstein, because Einstein told us almost everything, E equals MC squared. So vacuum isn't nothing. Vacuum is matter coupled with antimatter. And so you can take an electron and a positron and figure out what the mass of that electron is. And the mass of the positron would be the same. And then it's, it's known to have a distance between these two particles called the Compton wavelength. Well, energy divided by that distance is a force. Now you ask, well, what's the electric field of a focused intensity? Uh, and that's the same. The 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter intensity would give you that same force as what's holding that um, electron-positron pair together. And so if you went in there into vacuum, boom, we would blow those dipoles apart and we would actually just see matter be created out of nothing. 
as someone who is so passionate about the, the research itself and uh, yeah, the, the nitty gritty of it, I suppose, how has winning the Nobel Prize uh, it enabled you to um, advance that research or, or potentially even interfered with your your day-to-day -day time in the lab? Well, two things since 2018 have totally uh, changed how I uh, live. And the first one was winning the Nobel Prize. It just took me around the world. I mean, I don't think I understood um, how many requests I would get. And, and next thing you know, I was gone all the time. Uh, so I was going to have to learn how to start saying no more. And yet I said no to a lot, so I don't know. Um, and then COVID hit. And then I couldn't even go. I thought, oh, great, now I can stay home and, and not be so tired. But I still wasn't allowed in the lab. So both have changed my ability to do science with my students. I think um, my favorite part of the day would be to go into the lab and see what was going on in the lab. And for, for two year and a half, I was just traveling too much. And then for the next almost two years now, I've stayed in my dining room. So <laughs> I hope sometime to spend more time back in the lab again. Has it been challenging being, yeah, I guess it skyrockets you into becoming a public figure. You know, there was discussion that Okay. Um, before this, you didn't have a Wikipedia page, for example, and then you're a Nobel laureate. Um, yeah, has that ch transition, just on a personal level, been a, a difficult one to adjust to? It is. I think you have to um, keep telling yourself that, you know, to some extent, it's it's not real. And I've, I've said that it was good that I was almost 60 when I got this kind of uh, fame. I also am trying my best to enjoy it because it's it really has allowed things that normal people d don't get to do. And it's uh, given me tremendous opportunities uh, to meet people that uh, most of us don't get to meet. So, I mean, I have met now some Apollo astronauts that have landed on the moon. Um, I've met Brian May of Queen. I've met the Pope. Um, and so it's just like, isn't that amazing that I get to meet these incredible people? I also think it's weird that people think I'm incredible and go, really? Because, you know, not so much. So there you go. Now, one of the things that um, was much discussed about your winning is uh, perhaps not related to you as an individual, unfortunately, but is the underrepresentation of women, uh, n not just in the Nobel Prizes, but in the physical sciences more, more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, how has it felt to be, I suppose, a, a, a symbol of that wider issue? I think I, I found it actually very awkward because it was not an issue that I had actually spent any time thinking about. It, although I was one of the few women around, um, I was not one of the women that uh, was bothered by it in, in any way. People, uh, I've worked, I guess, with just great male colleagues who have um, always been great with me. and. Um, and so I've just been very lucky. And so I've just sort of, and maybe I've gone through with some blinders on, I don't know, but uh, to me it was not an issue. And so then it's been very difficult because yes, I've been sort of thrust into this. I mean, I was actually thrown for a loop at six in the morning. You know, you hear that you've won at five in the morning. I say yes to doing a press conference and then it says, so you're only the third woman. I went, really? <laughs> Did, hadn't noticed that, okay. So yeah, I've been, it's, it's been hard. Surprising as it's been, has, it, has there been any value in being able to, um I suppose, be, be something that maybe women who don't have that confidence in the physical sciences can look up to. Well, yes. I mean, I think it's been driven home, I guess. Until, you know, I'm one of those people, uh, you know, outside my own little world of lasers that you pretty much have to hit me pretty hard for me to understand things. So that's helped. And actually, when Andrea Gez won two years later, I, I emailed her and I said, I've started a new club. It's going to be called the Nobel Physics uh, Women uh, Club. And it's because it's the first time in history that there were two uh, female laureates alive at the same time, which is amazing that, yes, while I, for two years, I was the only woman holding a Nobel Prize in physics. And so she does not get to have that, you know, all by herself. Um, but anyway, she readily joined the club. So we have this little baby club of two people, and we're waiting to have our third person join us. Uh, and so I am made very aware of the fact that obviously that's ridiculous that there's only two women. Let me turn to the audience, because I think we have a, a, a question from our online audience here. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, my question would be, how do you think lasers can help fight um, global warming? I heard there is some research regarding um, tracking uh, greenhouse uh, gases in the atmosphere, but maybe there is something else um, going on in this particular field that you're aware of um, that would be very interesting. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for that, uh, Stefan. One of the things that I, I will say that I'm leading, uh, using my Nobel voice for, is to help with this initiative that I was working on before winning the Nobel Prize, but it uh, didn't catch, uh, I didn't get to catch the attention so much. And it is the Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring Initiative. So I was just in Glasgow where we had a satellite meeting about this. And it's the idea that all kinds of optics and photonics people make sensors. And that's because we make sensors just because we love the technology and we want to play with that technology. Uh, and But it could be used for anything. Uh, and then there's the environmental scientists who would love to be able to make all the measurements. It takes a tremendous amount of measurements in order to feed these climate models. But they're stuck because they can only use commercial um, sensors that are out there. So this initiative is trying to bring together technology people with environmental science people and public policy people to say, you know, what things do you want to change about public policy? Let's measure before and after and make sure that this public policy is doing what we think it should do. And so that's how we're going to use optics of all kinds, um, whether it's spectroscopy, whether it's LIDAR using lasers, all kinds of things. There's so many measurements that need to be done in order to get these really much better accurate, more accurate <laughs> climate models. And so that's how we're using optics. You spoke there about this. Uh, I, I suppose it wasn't a new avenue, but an avenue you were able to pursue through, through the win of the Nobel Prize. Um, to, to some extent. Um. Well, I think because for this, like I said, we want the public policy people there. So we really want government at all levels because environment has to be looked after from, from the United Nations. This is what they're saying at COP26. We need the government right from the United Nations down to the municipal levels. And so we need uh, scientists speaking with these government officials. I think somehow when you win a Nobel Prize and everybody all of a sudden thinks you have answers, I think government people think, oh, we should listen to her. She's a Nobel Prize winner. I Probably, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I probably don't know. You know, I certainly don't know more than I did before winning the Nobel Prize. Um, but I do, ha I do seem to get to have people listen to me, and so that's why I'm trying to use it for a good thing. There is a sense in when people hear, you know, a Nobel laureate, they think this person um, must be an expert in absolutely everything. Um, yeah, how do you rea react to that when you're asked for your input on something where maybe you, you don't feel like it? confident to speak on, on that topic. Yes, I mean, and people keep asking me about the imposter syndrome. I'm going, I've never felt it so much as I do now. Um, on the other hand, if it gets me somewhere, I don't know. I, um, I was asked to speak about oceans. I go, what have I got to do with oceans? But, you know, I got to meet Sylvia Earle, who is somebody who really does know about oceans, and so we speak together. But I, I try to make it very clear that I can only bring so much to the table and really about just using science in different ways. And um, But I also was asked at Starmus to, to talk about, you know, going to Mars. And I'm going, what do I know about going to Mars? But what the heck if you want me uh, to speak about that? And and that's uh, Starmus with Brian May of Queen and the Apollo astronauts. So you think, well, that's a good opportunity. So I'll just talk about going to Mars, even though I don't really know anything about it. So I do my best. But I pretty much always preface anything, letting people know how much I know. Uh, apart from uh, <laughs> with Brian May of Queen, mm -hmm. has, uh, winning the Nobel Prize opened up collaborations and interactions with other researchers in other fields or other parts of the world that otherwise seem like they would have been unlikely or harder to set up? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I think uh, people, I think, want to work with Nobel Prize winners, and so I have um, had these opportunities uh, to work with people. Uh, I, the one... Uh, collaboration that started just uh, like the month before, I'm always very careful to say this person wanted to work with me <laughs> even before I won the Nobel Prize. So <laughs> it's a legitimate they wanted to work with me. Um, but I think other people that are working with me now hopefully legitimately want to work with me. Um, but yes, I think the opportunities are just amazing when you, when you win something like the Nobel Prize. It feels a bit like uh, people who say, oh, I liked this band before they were popular. I had a collaboration <laughs> with Dennis Strickland before she won the Nobel Prize. Well, he doesn't say that. I'm the one who points <laughs> okay. out, you know. Okay. Now, um, just looking to the future and back to your, to your research, what, what is your dream for where, where lasers will go next? You know, you've spoken about, um, you know, in, improving power, improving, um, uh, I suppose, the, the intensity of the pulse. Um, are there other completely new directions other than kind of improvements on what we already have? 
Well, I think this is what usually we are trying to do. Can we go shorter? Can we go to a different wavelength? Can we go? So, I mean, some of my research is to take it out towards uh, the longer wavelengths where we have very few coherent sources. Uh, it's, lasers are still really only in certain regions, and we have to use nonlinear optics uh, or some other technique to move the coherent radiation wherever we want it to go. Um, optics people are also really great because it really optics really should be light, which means the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see, which is a very tiny, like I said, it wasn't even a factor of two difference in, in the frequency. But if you ask optics people, we now take everything from the terahertz of the far infrared all the way up to x-rays, and we'll call it all light, and we'll call it all optics. Um, and give us some time, I'm telling you, we'll go to the radio waves, and we'll go up to gamma rays, and we'll call it all optics, and we'll just take control of the EM spectrum. Um, so yeah, do, do, that's just where, and this is why I said when we do sensors, I'm trying to push the wavelength, I'm trying to push the intensity, I'll probably try to push the pulse duration. Uh, and usually my research is about making lasers other people don't have, and then people come to me and go, I'd like to use that laser. I'm like, great, because I'd like to learn about your science, so we'll do it together. We've spoken a lot about the surprises, the surprises of the Nobel, et cetera, but ha have you just been surprised by the discipline, how far lasers have come since or well, maybe even since before you were doing your PhD. Absolutely, I think um, when people are talking about these high intensity lasers and, and that they're saying that we're doing this laser acceleration, which is also um, Toshi Dejima, uh, you know, came up with a theory in the 70s, long before lasers could do whatever he was thinking. You know, you want, theorists, of course, aren't bothered by technology. They can dream up anything. Uh, and he's probably amazed that we're at the point where lasers can do some of this uh, acceleration. And I used to think, well, it's quite a dream to think, you know, I mean, my supervisor that won the Nobel Prize with me, Gerard Maru, well, you know, hoping that he's going to beat CERN with his, you know, with laser acceleration. And yet, um, undoubtedly, he probably will, because I you should never bet against Gerard. Um, but the fact that so many people are really thinking about laser acceleration for medicine, can we do better than the linear accelerators that are at hospitals now? Can we do radiation treatment that we can't do now, all with lasers, you know, having these um, particles sort of surf the wave behind the light is uh, pretty amazing. And could you just expand briefly on what, what that could open up to be able to bring lasers into this medical context? Well, there's different things. One uh, is the fact that uh, linear accelerators are, are pretty big things. So we can do the acceleration a thousand times faster with these uh, lasers. On the other hand, we can only have focused intensity for a very small, short space. So we can't necessarily get to the energies easily. So there's some technological things to work out. But if we could get beyond what the hospital scale linear accelerator can do, um, how deep um, a charged particle can go depends on how energetic it is. So if we can get more energetic, maybe we can do brain cancers that are further in that we couldn't do now. But there's also other people researching uh, smaller scale ones that we could do cancer that's either right on the skin or right on the surface of you know going in with a fiber optic or something like that. So there's different uh, venues that one could think about using it. We, we mentioned that you're more of a, a laser-focused person than the kind of applications-focused person, but do, do you have extensive conversations with those people who are who are thinking of these applications and working on getting your innovations into those domains? Well, Toshi Tajima is talking to me right now about uh, using his laser acceleration ideas uh, for medical applications, and we have almost monthly conversations, and then I have to keep saying, but my laser's still broken. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you when we get our laser working. So, because um, he keeps moving his theory forward faster than I keep getting my laser to work. So I don't know. Um, but yes, so hopefully that's something that uh, works well together. It's, it's reassuring to know that even once you have a Nobel Prize, that you can still be held back by faulty lab equipment. <laughs> exactly. exactly. As someone who could never um, get experimental physics to work for me, that's, that's very, uh, very pleasant. You need a lot of patience if you want to be an experimentalist, yes. Um, has your, uh, the team you work with directly, have you been able to expand, expand your team and expand the research that's happening within your lab? Yes, uh, I probably do have the biggest group I've ever had. I'm not a good people manager, so I'm probably pushed right now to the limit I should be in, in um, with the group size that I have. And also with these COVID restrictions and only being allowed two people in the lab, I'm, I'm finding that whole thing uh, juggling very hard, and especially as most of my day is still spent doing um, 
online talks to people around the world, um, and I'm not a great juggler, so. <laughs> well, thank you for juggling this <laughs> among so many others. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. This uh, was our final conversation, I'm sad to say, of the day, but thank you, Donna, for joining us, and uh, thank you to our audience for your great questions throughout the day, and uh, for taking part. That's it for this year's Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. <laughs>